All right. Hello. Welcome back. Seems particularly exciting today. Did something just happen, or everyone's just yeah? What? Uh, the pre-frosh are here visiting. Yes. Okay. We have a couple of uh, visitors from class. So, all right. Um, let's continue on where we left off. We were talking about the game Twenty Questions, and we were figuring out what the best scheme of questions is to uh, find the object in the least number of guesses on average using um, by knowing ahead of time what the probabilities were of all the objects. And what we noticed was that oops, a question scheme was equivalent to a code of binary sequences. And in fact, there were several things we were looking at here. It must be a prefix code. Um, the space of objects X is embedded in a binary tree. as the leaves, and um, we said that the code word lengths denoted by L of X satisfy the craft inequality. Okay, so the, I'll write the craft inequality here. That was that the sum of all the objects of 2 to the negative length of x has to be less than or equal to 1. That's craft inequality. Okay. In fact, these three statements are all equivalent. There's sort of a catch between what, what I'm saying there. Okay, what I really mean is uh, prefix code, you can always embed it in a binary tree. We looked at how to do that and where the, the code words appear at the leaves of the tree. From any binary tree of that form, you can peel out a prefix code. Um, we know that any prefix code must satisfy the craft inequality. Now, the only catch to saying that they're all equivalent is just because your code satisfies the craft inequality doesn't automatically make it a prefix code. It means you can construct a prefix code with those lengths. Just to give, just to give that example. So... Okay, and so here's an example. Just to be, just to give a silly example, suppose that X uh, was just two objects, A and B, and suppose that you assign a code word for A that's just zero, and you assign a code word for B that's also zero. Okay, 
uh, this is not a prefix code. It's not going to work. Um, you're not actually learning anything by seeing the code word. But, of course, this does satisfy craft inequality. Because if I sum x over the set AD, 2 to the negative length, well, both lengths are 1. And so that equals 1. So this is just to point out that satisfying craft inequality does not imply it's a prefix code or that it's but it does imply that it, you could construct a prefix. So that leads us to another way of viewing this optimization problem. Which is find integer lengths that satisfy the craft inequality. And we want to minimize the average length, sum over x, p of x, lx. Okay, so now it's just a problem of finding these integers. We reduce it to this problem. And we will make some progress by relaxing this a little bit. Relaxation, which says, let's not worry about using integers. Okay, so of course it's cheating. We get rid of the integer part. Um, but this can only help us, by, by getting rid of requirements, it can help us get maybe shorter uh, average length, which will serve as a lower bound. So this will get us a lower bound on how short of an average length we can get. Uh, and it'll be easily solvable. Okay, so now all we have to do is find some variables, L, that satisfy craft inequality and attempt to minimize that. Okay, so so this can be done with Lagrange multipliers. I'll go ahead and do it here. You're not necessarily expected to have experience with LeBron's multipliers. But um, I'll do it, and maybe you'll get something out of this. Uh, what, what you do is you define the, the function you're trying to minimize, um, which is this thing. And I'm just going to define it as j. But then I add in some con the constraint. So I add in uh, some, some variable lambda times what I, a quantity that I have constrained to be negative. Okay, and the constraint to be negative quantity is this. It comes from craft inequality. Okay, so this cannot be positive, right? So that's what craft inequality says. So if you throw that in, multiply it by something I'm going to require to be positive, this will always serve as a lower bound on j. And in the end, I'm going to choose the lambda that maximizes this lower bound. So the the, uh, let's use calculus and take the derivative of this thing. But with respect, now my notation might bother some of you here, but for each x, I'm going to take a derivative. And the derivative is res with respect to p of that particular x. Okay. Um, in fact, just to make notation a little nicer, I'm going to, for these sums, I'm going to sum over x prime. So it's not, it doesn't look like it's the same x. Okay, so those were sum over some dummy variable x prime. And now I'm taking a derivative with respect to p of, a, of any arbitrary value of x. Now, there's only one term in this sum that matches the value of x I'm taking the derivative of. So everything else is 0. And you just get um, L of x. And then you get plus lambda. Same thing with this other sum. The 1 goes away. The only thing in here that depends on um, 
Oh, hold on. Uh, sorry, I don't want to do P. I want to do L. Derivative with respect to L. That's what I'm trying to design. P is fixed. I'm trying to define, design L to minimize this thing. So this first part is P of X. And then the second part is just going to be lambda, and only the term that matches x matters. And so you get um, 2 to, you get negative, I'll bring that minus out front, minus lambda, 2 to the negative lx, log, natural log of 2. Okay, so this, uh, to, to minimize this thing, I want to set that equals to 0. And this is going to help me identify my optimal choice of L which I'll denote L star. So L star will be the choice of L that minimizes this. Okay. So we can solve that here. Oops. 2 to the minus L star of X equals uh, P of X. Nope. Yeah. P of X over lambda times ln of 2. All right, so then that means L star of X equals log 2 of lambda ln of 2 over P of X. Now, the only thing that's annoying here is, what is this lambda? Well, the way you finish up the argument with Lagrange multipliers is you say, well, lambda's been trained to be positive. Also, been trained to sat we have this craft inequality that has to be satisfied, so we choose lambda now to satisfy that craft inequality. Um, so what does that mean? Well, craft inequality said that the sum of the x is 2 to the minus L star of x had to be less than 1. But we now have an expression for that in terms of lambda. So this here equals um, the sum over x of P of x over lambda ln 2. All right. So let's just choose lambda to make this equal 1. Oh, by the way, sum over x of this thing, that just equals 1 over lambda ln of 2. So now we see that we can choose lambda equals 1 over ln of 2, and that will satisfy craft inequality with equality. So once we do that, the lambda, let me put a little arrow here. This came from that definition. The lambda and the ln of 2 go, cancel, and we get a very simple expression. That is, L star of x should just be log 2 of 1 over P of x. Okay, so that's the uh, result we get from the Lagrange multipliers. That is the optimal choice under craft inequality for, for L. <laughs> So what have we done? We've relaxed it to not necessarily be integer. This might not be an integer, and therefore we can't really use these as a code word link. But if these are integers, then we happen to have found the optimal code word link. Okay, so um, when would this be integers for all x, by the way? I mean, we just have to basically say um, that means that uh, p of x equals 2 to the negative some integer, right? So negative k, where k is an integer. I'll say k of x because it doesn't have to be the same k for each x. So if you, this is given a name, we call these dyadic distributions. So if, you're, if your probabilities were dyadic, they just happen to be powers of 2, then uh, fine, we know the optimal lengths uh, for the questioning. But, but in general, we'd still like to know what the optimal lengths are. But we, this does give us a lower bound. What's the lower bound it gives? So 
it says that the expected length for it, of x for any scheme, by the way, this by this notation, I just mean what we've defined in the first place, the sum over x of the probabilities of x, the length of x. That's what we're trying to minimize, expected length of our questioning. And we know that it's going to be at least as large as this relaxate, the uh, lengths of the relaxed version, which aren't integers. And now we can calculate what that is exactly. That's the expected value of the log is 2 of 1 over p of x. And if I write that explicitly instead of writing expected value, if I write that as the sum, it's the sum of p of x log 1 over p of x, which we defined in the last lecture. That's the entropy of x. Okay, so there we've defined, we've derived this lower bound that your questioning will always have an average number that's at least the entropy of the distribution. This very nice quantity that uh, that we'll take to mean the information content of of a random variable with a given distribution. Okay, so we see that the lower bound of questions is the entropy. Uh, we can also get a very simple upper bound. And to do this, we'll just do, use what was is, is uh, referred to as the Shannon code. And that is, let's just choose the following integer length. Let L of X equal the rounding up of what we obtained from the Lagrange multipliers. So this means round up to the nearest integer. Okay. We know that at least uh, that is going to be integer, right? L of x is integer. And does it satisfy craft inequality? Yes, because all we've done is uh, increase increased length. So for every code word, we just increased the length or left it the same. If you look at craft inequality, that can only help. If this satisfied craft inequality, this does as well. All right. And um, notice the following as well. That the length of this new code is not more than one extra bit of the length of the other code because we just rounded up. We can't have rounded up and added more than one. So that gives us, quite simply, this uh, upper bound that says here is a construction for a code that um, is where it's less than, the average length is less than the average length of L, L star plus one. And in case you don't have familiarity with doing expected values, we'll write this out as the sum so we can see that it just simplifies. P of x times this thing. That, and now we'll split it into two sums. Okay. And that second term, the sum of p of x, is just 1 for any distribution. So that is just um, h of x. We already determined what the average length was for L star. Plus 1. So we know that we can build a code that gets within one bit of the entropy, one question of the entropy. So it's pretty pretty good approximation for what the best code is going to get is entropy. All right. Um, notice a couple things about this. Um, do you think that this might be optimal? No. 
Well, probably by the way the lecture's flowing, it's not because I still have more to say about this. <laughs> but um, how about could it ever be optimal? I mean, maybe it's not optimal all the time, but maybe uh, under some distributions it is. When might be, what kind of distribution might this be optimal for? What? Uniform? Um, yeah, uh, you know, actually, it depends on what the size of X is, whether it'll be optimal for uniform. Um, so it will be optimal if it's dyadic distribution, because we just said that if it's a dyadic distribution, then L star is already integer, right? So then you're not changing anything. You're just using L star. Fine. Um, the interesting thing is, if it's not dyadic, this cannot be optimal. Okay. So um, So remember, craft inequality told us something about these lengths, how they had to, they couldn't all be small, for example. Craft inequality didn't have anything to do with the distribution of X. But yet, using craft inequality alone, you can know whether something is suboptimal, because if you do not satisfy this, this craft inequality up here, there's always a way to shorten at least one code word. Okay, you can, this is, you can see this by thinking of embedding your code into this binary tree. And the only way it's crafting the quality is not met is if there are some branches that don't have any code words down them. And you can always then take some code words and shorten them in that case. Okay, so, so since we can shorten some code words, that can't be optimal. Of course, we, what we know here is we've lengthened this met crafting equality. Sorry, this one satisfied crafting equality. So unless Lx equals L, L, Lx is not going to satisfy craft inequality with equality. All right, it's not going to meet it with equality. So it'll be suboptimal. But yet it still can be a, a, a good code. You, actually, we've shown this Shannon code credit is always still going to get within entropy plus one. Question, right? So, yeah? Yes. Oh, uh, it seems like it should be strict because this is strictly less than L star plus one, right? Because if it was, if you had an integer already, you wouldn't round up. So I, I think it should be strictly less. Yeah. Um, okay, so to summarize what we have here, let's let L, let's let capital L star be the minimum expected length for all prefix code. All right, then we know that H of X is less than or equal to L star is less than h of x plus 1. So that's what we're able to show here. Um, any questions about that? Yeah. 
Okay. Let's look at the solution to this problem. They're called Huffman codes. Some of you, I guess, have already encountered Huffman codes in algorithms classes. I don't know if, how much of the full explanation you had of Huffman codes. Um, but let me just explain where these come from. So we have David Huffman in 1951 was in an information theory class, and it was taught by Fano. So he's at MIT, and he's in a class taught by, by Fano. Now, information theory was a very new topic. Um, the founder of information theory was Claude Shannon. We've seen the name Shannon in this lecture already. He came up with these amazing results that showed that entropy solves all sorts of, uh, is the answer to many problems in communication and compression. And very nice, mathematically precise uh, characterizations of this. And um, Fano worked on some coding problems with him, and Fano's name is also well known in information theory. And he um, had actually come, attempted to solve this problem with Shannon. So we already saw a Shannon code. And there's also a Shannon Fano code, which Coincidentally, it was invented in this class as well, last lecture, uh, when I asked you to think of how you would solve this problem. And one of you, I, I don't remember the face exactly who it was, maybe uh, raise your hand uh, to tell me who it was, uh, said, why don't we sort all of the probabilities and then try to divide them in half? Was this, was this you? Yeah, okay. Try to divide it evenly and then go up to the top sorted part and try to divide that as evenly according to probability as possible and the bottom part as well. Okay, so this is known as the Shannon Fano code. And uh, they, you know, they probably, I'm, I'm guessing they didn't know if it was optimal or not. <laughs> so they probably attempted to prove that it was optimal, but it turns out it's not optimal. Okay, so then Huffman is taking this class from Shan Fano only a few years after the beginning of information theory, and there's a, a choice to either do a term paper on the topic that Fano chose, which was to solve this problem, basically. It wasn't that you had to solve this problem, but you had to think about it and write something about it and so forth, or you had to take a final. And Huffman was either, he, he was working on it, and then he was about to give up because he couldn't prove that he had something optimal, and then he, he came up with a nice proof. So. He solved the problem that Fano couldn't solve, so it was kind of fun. Um, so here's how we construct these codes. All right. So we are going to start with it sorted, but the main idea here is you need to construct the codes from the bottom first, not from the from the last question first, not from the first one to the last. So here's what that means. Start with x, sorted by probability, all right, now let me just explain the algorithm by example because it's a, it's a very simple algorithm. All right, you, here's my values of x, I'm going to just assume they're sorted and I'll just give them simple labels, a, b, C, D, E. So X is just that set. These are the objects. Okay. And let's put their probabilities here. And we'll just, for this example, do 0 0.25. Valid probabilities, we should sum to one, which they do. Okay, so now what we do is we start with the least, the two least probable items, and we're going to merge them. They're going to share the same code word up to the last bit. Okay, so what we do is we take these and we merge them, and when we merge them, we say, well, the, the probability of the merge is the sum of these two, 0.3. So I'm going to merge and I'm going to sort in the same step. I'm going to combine these to make a 0.3. I'm going to resort, which pushes it to the top. Okay, so 
to do that. All right, we'll do. We'll, we'll give in. Okay, so I'm going to do this and put point three here, and leave everything else the same. And I'll draw a line just to show that these have moved down. Okay. Now I merge the bottom two again. So that's going to add up to 0.45. That will move it to the top of the list here. And then the other ones get bumped down. And then I merge these two to make 0.55. I move down the 0.45. Finally, I merge these last two to get one. Okay. Now, if you blur your eyes, this is actually a binary tree with the root up here. But it's all like tangled up. I've taken the branches and shifted them. So if you like, if you shook it out and made it all straight, then you'd have your binary tree that defines your prefix code. But let's come up with a nice simple way to do that on paper here. Um, okay. So. Every branch I'm going to label with a 0 and a 1. And now I'm going to read out code words for these objects by tracing up the tree and seeing what, uh, the, what, their, what branches they took. Okay, so that means is, let's do this code word. I'll write the code word over here. So for A, I go, now I didn't put a label on the parts that aren't branches, this didn't break. Right? So A goes this way, this way, and then it goes up this branch, which was the one, and then it's got a zero here. So it's a one, zero, I flip the order, so it's a zero, one. Okay, so zero, one. All right, is the code for A, the code word for A. Now for B, do something similar. Here, it's got a zero, and a one, so it's one, zero. See why I'm flipping the order, because I really should read the code out from the root. All right, and then similarly for C, I've got a one, and a one. For D, you have a zero, zero, zero. And last one. For E, we have a 1, 0, 0, so 0, 0, 1. Okay, so we're claiming that this is an optimal prefix code. We're always going to at least check, is it a prefix code? So you can run through and you can see that, notice what's happened to make it a prefix code. Uh, we could have had every, we could have had up to four code words of length 2 that would be unique, but then we couldn't have anything longer. So we have three of them have length two, and then the, the last one, which would be zero, zero, becomes the prefix for these lines. Zero, 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 one. You can verify there are no, no code words a prefix of another code word. All right? And this algorithm we can prove actually always produces an optimal prefix code. Now, why am I saying an optimal prefix code? Well, here's one reason. Let me just make another table here. These are the lengths of these code words. So, there are many ways of creating a different code with the same code word length. All right? For example, I can come here and I can change these. And they still keep the same code word length. Right? So I can assign the code for A to B and the code for B to A. Um, and there, that means they're all going to be optimal. All right? This is just one of them. In fact, it's sometimes on purpose, uh, someone might want to design... Um, might want to design these right. after they've obtained the code word length from the Huffman code. They may want to design them, for example, to be an offset or they're going to be a binary number or something. All right, so changing them around but keeping the lengths the same is still optimal.
All right. So we've we've solved the twenty questions problem. Okay. Um, so what does this have to do with this class? Any ideas? Data compression. Okay. Let's, let's talk about data compression. Yeah. So. So here, what we want, this is actually lossless data compression because what we've done here, um, we're going to do some, we're going to take a sequence of information and turn it into a sequence of bits from which we can recover the original information. Okay, so that makes it lossless. So suppose, for example, let me show you an example here. Suppose we look up what Wikipedia says about Huffman code. We find right here, this is just, you know, scroll down a few paragraphs. We find an example of using Huffman code on letters of the alphabet. All right. So here's a prefix code for letters of the alphabet and space based on their frequencies of use. Now, not every letter is used equally often. Notice that E is very common, A is common, so forth. So um, now, if you didn't care about compressing and you just want to represent text uh, digitally, you could use something like ASCII, which just assigns everything the same number of bits. Um, but if you wanted to use the least bits and still be able to get your text back, then what you could do is use this code to represent each uh, each letter, right? So. You could turn a sequence of letters into a sequence of bits by just taking every letter in your sentence and replacing it with this bit sequence. Okay, and that makes us want to talk about codes for a minute and what what's possible with coding. Why do we want to use the twenty questions problem to solve this problem? All right. Uh, anyone want to suggest why Huffman codes or the solution to the twenty questions problem would be at least a reasonable thing to do here. Yeah. Good. So now I'm going to ask, what do you mean by uniquely specified? Okay. That's a good lead up to what we'll talk about right now. Good. Okay. Because, um, Suppose you define some mapping, an encoder that takes a letter, now uh, takes some, for all x in your space of, alpha, of whatever the alphabet is that your signal is originally in, okay? You have some f of x which goes to bits, right? Zero, one, star. In other words, um, binary sequences of perhaps variable length. Uh, I'm going to say in. So f of x takes your symbol and turns it into some binary sequence. Actually, I'm going to use the same notation we had before. Instead of f, I'm going to call it c. So you have some code for every for every x. Okay. Now, there's a number of different things we could ask for here. We could ask for um, non-singular codes. And that would mean that c of x does not equal c of y for all x not equal to y. Okay, so that's one class of codes. We, we, of course, want this. It wouldn't be good if this weren't true. All right, but we actually need more than just this because I could come up with a non-singular code that you still wouldn't be able to get the text back from. 
Why is that? Oh, you're saying like every time you use the function, it could give a different, you could define, define some function that changes with time, some time variant function. Okay, now imagine that it's time invariant, that your, your encoding function does the same thing every time. Is it still, is it a problem? Can you come up with a problem, Susan? Yeah. Yes, okay, so we're, we're going to assume, and I didn't say this, but we're going to assume that you don't know how many bits each letter took when you're trying to read it back. Okay, because this is what we call non-punctuating code. So we don't get to punctuate our binary sequence in the end. We're just going to store it in memory, and someone's going to come along later and try to read it out, and there's not going to be little commas to show where the code was ended. All right, so... Um, So we have what we would call uniquely decodable. And that means that when, um, that the sequence, F, uh, not F, when, we, when looked at, so non-punctuating, Always decodable. Okay, now what that means is we'll put S of X1, sorry, C of X1, C of X2, CX3, whatever sequence of letters or whatever our signal is, we just copy the bits back to back, dot, 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 and we want that no matter what sequence of X1, X2, X3, so forth we have, you can come along later and you can read it all out. You know, put as many of these together as you want. I do get to see the end, let's say, but but I don't get to see where any of the individuals uh, ended. Yes. Good question. I, I was hoping some of you would think that it doesn't necessarily mean it's prefix code. Okay. So uh, let's. That would be our next category. Would be prefix codes. And I will call this also instantaneous code. And so what that means is, well, we know what prefix codes mean. The reason to call it instantaneous is that you can always decode it the moment you get to the end of that letter's code word. Okay, you don't ever have to look ahead. So what that the, the truth about uniquely decodable codes is you can come up with a uniquely decodable code where you have to wait till later and work back just to figure out what the current letter is. Okay, so we have examples of these. Maybe I'll put one in your problem set or you can look in, you can look in books. You can find examples of these uniquely decodable codes. So we have this, this here. We've got all codes. We have non-singular. We have uniquely decodable. And then we have inside there prefix. And these are all strict. So you can come up with examples of uniquely decodable codes that are not prefix codes, which means they're not instantaneous. You can't pull out the letter every time right when the code word's done. Okay. So, we're really interested in uniquely decodable codes, making those as short as possible. However, the nice part is you can prove that uniquely decodable codes still satisfy craft inequality. So you're not you're not getting anything by looking in this category. You can get the exact same uh, lengths with prefix codes, so unless for some reason you want to be cryptic. Okay, there's not really a reason to to go outside of the prefix codes.
Okay, so we can use prefix codes. In <coughs> the best prefix code as, in terms of average length is the Huffman code. So we can use Huffman codes to do this sort of encoding. Now, there's still one reason to consider improving on the Huffman code description that I've given, and that is the following. Um, well, we, we know that Huffman codes do almost as well as the entropy of the information, but there's a gap, okay? And uh, it turns out that we can, get, we can get rid of that gap if we were not just encoding a single letter at a time. Okay, so one trick. Um, so let me show you. Uh, consider encoding blocks. So you might now look at, uh, let's say it's text. Instead of just coming up with a code for all letters plus space, you might want a code that comes up for all pairs of letters. There's a lot of those, right? So you'll have AA, AB, AC, dot, dot, dot. So look at all pairs. Now, again, for, for all codes that encode this way, we, we know the optimal one is the Huffman code. So you can now design a Huffman code. Okay, and we now know that the expected length of this new Huffman code is going to be less than the entropy of a pair. It's not just x, but it's x1, x2 plus 1. Okay, and um, if you study entropy a little bit, it's easy to show that the entropy of this pair is at least less than or equal to the sum of the two entropies. So what we realize now is by encoding pairs, we should expect that we basically at least, you're going to get something like double the amount of bits, otherwise something very miraculous is going on, right? Um, but you actually, the upper bound on how well the Huffman code is actually slightly better because then if we say, um, if we look at L, star over 2. That would be the average number of bits we use per letter since we are doing pairs, right? Then that's going to be less than or equal to, um, and I'm going to just combine these two since I'm assuming right now that the distribution of, of one letter is the same marginally as the distribution of another letter somewhere else. Okay. Then these would have the same entropy. So you would have that plus a half. And if you encoded longer blocks, then this is going to be smaller and you'll get much closer to the entropy. Now there's actually a bigger advantage to why you might encode blocks than what I've described. I described it as getting rid of this one bit overhead. Okay, maybe you think big deal, who cares about that? Now in reality, compression, data compression is not limited to text. We no longer care too much about compressing text because we have other much bigger sources of data, right? But these same principles apply to other media as well. Okay, and so this one bit can be problematic because maybe you have a very low entropy uh, signal. Um, but but there's another reason why these pairs, why it might be uh, important to do things that in pairs. And that's because they might be correlated. So English language definitely is correlated, any language is. If you see a Q, you know what the next letter is, right? And, and for any letter, when you see it, you have a modified conditional distribution of the next letter. And this correlation should help you compress better. Okay, and if you just compressed every letter by itself, using a Huffman code on the alphabet, you would, you would gain something over, over uncompressed text, but you wouldn't take advantage of the correlation. When you do Huffman code over blocks, you, you look at the joint entropy and, and you can show that this, this captures the correlation. So that this will actually be much less than this. They're correlated. Okay, so you could potentially compress a lot further. Think about any signal uh, that you're familiar with. Think about sound. If you're compressing, if you if you have, well, actually, I'm going to get into sound here. So let's let's talk about images for a second. Um, if you look at neighboring pixels in a high-resolution image, 
their, their values are likely to be very similar. And if you compress each pixel separately, ignoring its context, you're not going to do a great job compressing, because okay? you're going to be using a lot of bits to write neighboring pixels that are almost identical. Instead, you, you might want to do, let's say, a Huffman code over blocks. That would be one way to try to take advantage of that. Okay. The, the, uh, the actual way that this is done is you try to transform your signal in such a way where the components are independent. And then you don't have to worry about their correlation. You, you've kind of taken care of, you, you'll get the savings in some other way, but you don't have to worry about encoding over blocks in that way. And so uh, it turns out that um, the transformation that works for many signals to make their components nearly independent is a Fourier transform. <laughs> so, so, uh, so for image compression, for example, the uh, for image compression, the JPEG standard originally, at least, was to do a small a Fourier transform over some block of your image, and then um, once you've done that Fourier transform. Then you, you, they kind of just do lossless compression on each, uh, on each value of the transform separately, and they just don't worry about trying to worry about correlations among Fourier transform components because those are generally almost independent. Whereas if you didn't take the Fourier transform, we just explained that neighboring pixels of an image are very correlated. You would do a bad job compressing if you didn't look at the neighbors when you compress. So uh, now JPEG has been updated around 2000 that instead of the Fourier transform, it uses the wavelet transform because they feel that does a better job. Now, if you look at audio compression, it does the same thing. Good audio compression, like MP3 and other more modern audio compression, will, will work in the Fourier domain before they go trying to compress. Okay. Um, okay, so... Okay, so now let's just talk about actual, we'll, we'll step away a little bit from this uh, coding, and we'll just talk about actual quantization of a signal. Actually, uh, something I missed, I, I want to tell you, so I'm, I'm actually going to go back just just for a minute here um, to give you an example just of this one of the savings that I mentioned um, that I said you could get not from the correlation but just maybe the more minor savings that you get because of this uh, this one bit on the upper bound of the Huffman code performance let's just look at an example of a uh, of a code that where the Huffman code is very far away from the entropy and, and it's easy to come up with an example in the following way. Um, just let x be binary. It's got two, two things in this universe, a and b. And we're going to then say, um, but the probability of a equals 0 0.1, and the probability of of uh, whoops, that's not a. Of b equals 0 0.9. Okay. Now for binary spaces, we can look at the entropy. Uh, we can calculate the entropy for any distribution, but it's very familiar and common to look at the entropy of binary random variables. So let's say here's the entropy of x, and here is the probability of one of the values, let's say A. Turns out it's symmetric. So this entropy goes up to one bit when they're at point 5. So if these two objects were equally likely, this has one bit of entropy. But at the edges, it's 0. And it's some concave function like this. That's symmetric, of course. Known as the binary entropy function. In fact, the, um, the word bit first appears uh, in a paper by Shannon where he's referring to the information content of something and he says, let's use bit, and uh, he borrows the term from a, from a colleague 
Uh, and now we use bit for everything in the digital age, but it actually was originally meant to mean the entropy being one bit. And so just because you have a zero and a one to write with, uh, if you knew it was zero, then it wouldn't be a bit. It would be zero information. It's a bit if someone's actually put something there that you that carries some information and therefore you can't just guess it beforehand. All right. So here's the entropy of a, of a binary random variable. And um, we're looking at this point here. So we're, we're here and it turns out the entropy is about a half. It's a little more than a half in this case. I think um, no, it's a little less than half actually, I think. So yeah. So h of x here is a little bit less than half um, in bits. Now, the Huffman code, you could probably guess it, but let's write it out. A, B, probabilities point, uh, whoops, B, A, probabilities point 0.9, point 0.1, boom. Any binary thing can only have one uh, only one code that works for it. You assign one of them zero, you assign one of them one. So the average length, expected length of x equals one bit, even though the, the uh, entropy is small. Now if I had skewed this even more, made that maybe a 0 0.01 and a 0.99, then uh, the entropy would actually be very small, but I would still be encoding with one bit every time. Now this actually, is relevant because you might have some signal, say, uh, think of an image that's almost all black with just a few white dots. Uh, and that is, um, the frequency then would be very skewed. And you don't want to have to go use a bit for every pixel. Um, and so what we see is we can trim off this by looking at pairs. If we looked at, um, let me move this down. Okay, so if we looked at the probability of AA, now I'm going to assume that they're just independent. So we're not going to get any savings because of the correlation. We're just going to try to trim off that overhead. So that's going to be 0 0.01. 0 0.09. All right, and now we would, um, I have it in reverse sorted order, but I'll just do it that way. Okay, so then we would combine these. That would move it up to the, sorry to do everything upside down here. It just happened that the most likely things were at the bottom of my list. I don't want to redraw them. So, um, oh, and I've already messed up because of it. Okay. So we get... Uh, 0 0.1. Oh, uh, no, no, no. Okay, so this one stays the most likely, 0 0.81. These two just move up to that spot. 0 0.1, 0 0.09. And then these combine, but they stay in the lowest spot. 0 0.81, 0 0.19. And then they combine again. And I assign out some zeros and ones. It doesn't matter that I'm doing this upside down because we just want the length. And so I see that um, the length of AA equals, it, it goes up three branches, three. The length of AB is also three. The length of BA equal two and the length of BB equaled 1, okay? And so then the average length, expected length of X1, X2 is going to be the sum of all these lengths here times their probabilities. So it's 3 times 0 0.01 plus 3 
times 0 0.09 plus 2 times 0 0.09 plus 0 0.81. Did not calculate this ahead of time, but it's uh, these things. What was that? 5 times that? It's about 0.5. Okay, so it's going to be something around 1.3. Is that right? What was it? 1.3 what? You said 1.38. Should I trust that? No. <laughs> anyway, okay. Why don't we invite the guests to answer? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, so I'm just going to leave it approximately 1.3. And that's better than two, right? It would have been two if we encoded them each separately. So we're getting closer to, you know, double the entropy. Okay, there was the example. All right. Okay, so let's look at um, quantizing a signal, meaning we're going to start by representing represent a number with a point in a finite set. Okay, so what I mean by that is, suppose we start with just a real number, like you've measured the voltage on a wire, you've measured the pressure at a point in time, this is going to be relate to, say, an audio signal, which is measuring the pressure at various points in time. Right. Okay, just take any one point in time. We have a number that we've measured. What is quantization is we're going to convert that to a point in a finite set. So we're going to have some quantizer that's going to be some function that maps the reals to some subset of the reals where the size of that set is just, I'll say, 2 to the b for b bit quantizer. So 2 to the b means uh, this is the number of the so it's the size of the set. Okay, so this here is the size of the set of B bit sequences. Okay, so um, we have some function that's going to map a real number to to a point. Let me draw an example. Suppose we have we want to talk about a four bit quantizer. So we have the real numbers here. Call this X, and then we have some points. So let me let me just mark here's zero whatever the real number line. We have some points, and that's our set A. And we only get four of them because it's a oh no I want two bit quantizer. So we're, let's look at a two bit quantizer. So that gives us four points in A. And then our quantizer then just maps, for every x, it has to map it to a point. So maybe that one goes to f of x. Maybe this one goes to that point there. Okay, so f of x for that point x is another spot in A. And the, the uh, design part is, well, we're going to have to decide where things go, say, when they're between points. Maybe that goes there. Um, you, it's possible you could define it however you want. You can have a point go... This point you map to that quantization point if you want. Okay. Um, so let's now define the error to be the difference. So E is the difference between where you quantized it and what the actual value should have been. So in other words, the, the signal after quantizing it is just the sum of the original signal plus this error that we created by our quantizer.
All right, so to minimize the error, or to minimize, let's say, the absolute value of E, then we would um, assign all X to their nearest point in A. Okay, so I'm going to represent that with, uh, let's do another number line here. Let's put our A points. Here are, here's A. We label this number line. This is X and this, uh, let's put a zero there. Okay, and then um, basically we're going to have regions where we say anything here is in one region. Here's another region. Okay, so everything in this light blue gets mapped to the, uh, the point in that region. And the way I came up with these regions are simply by finding the midpoints the, between these two, and I know if it's closer here, it has to map over to that point. Okay. So once you're given the quantization points, then the the uh, function to do the quantization is pretty straightforward if you're trying to minimize error. Now, there's a particular case, choice for A is um, uniform quantization. So uniform quantization just makes these things have equal distance between them. So if you have a certain number of bits in a uniform quantizer, then you can then uh, you've defined the quantizer by defining the gap between quantization points, and also by uh, and and from that you know you get a dynamic range of your quantizer, which means what's the the biggest distance between the highest quantization point and the lowest. So if you're going to use a uniform quantization, uh, you're going to want to make sure your signal doesn't leave that interval of the highest quantization point and the lowest quantization point very often, because you're going to lose a lot of information if it goes outside there. But okay, so um, So for CDs, let's see, CD quantization. Uh, is uniform. So what you do is you, um, oh, actually, no, I'm getting to this later. I got of myself. Okay. Yeah, we're on CDs, fine. Consider <laughs> audio sampling. Okay, so, so CD audio, we already talked about that being a 44 kilohertz sample rate. Sixteen bits of sampling is the standard. So sixteen bits per sample. Now if that's often you, more more bits are used, but and two channels for stereo sound. So stereo means that you have a different left and a right speaker sound, so that you get some sort of spatial feel for the, for the sound you're listening to, which means you have to have two different channels encoded. Okay, 
if we calculate this out, let's just look at how many bits is CD using. There's 44.1 thousand samples per second times 16 times 2 equals, just did that in my head, um, that many bits per second. Okay, so we have that many bits per second. Let's convert it to some units we're, we're maybe more familiar with thinking about. So 176,400 bytes. I just divided by 8. Okay, and how about if we look at bytes per minute? So 10 million. bytes per minute. Okay. Now, when you download or, or carry songs on your MP3 players, do you have, um, do, well, what's the size of a song? How many? What? Three megabytes per a song? Not even for a minute, and minute, and songs go for three or four minutes. So you're looking at about a megabyte for for minute, and that's the advantage of compressed audio. So CD, this doesn't try to compress. This is just a very straightforward sampling uh, method. Um, it's just doing the following. Oh, and by the way, this isn't even this doesn't account for overhead because there's actually always some overhead. Uh, when you use some standard for writing files. And it um, it's not even the highest quality. Now, it is going to be good quality, but sometimes people uh, actually increase the number of bits per sample. So it's not uncommon to use 20 or 24 bits per sample. And that is just going to increase this uh, file size accordingly, right? Um, so let me just point out what is going on, what we know goes on in this process. This will be the last part of today's lecture. We start out with a pressure wave. Looks like this. We then go through a microphone. And it looks the same, but this is a voltage wave. Then we do an anti-aliasing filter. What does that do? Yes, it removes the inaudible part of the sound. Removes the inaudible part. In other words, the high frequencies that your ear's not going to hear. And that makes it band limited. So what comes out here is a little bit of a filtered thing. I'll just draw it slightly different. Okay, something different. And then, next part is sample and quantize. Now, until you get to the quantize part, and what comes out of that is just something like this. And you have to have a decoder that knows what that means. Okay, But if you sample above Nyquist, then you don't lose anything. So, so far, up to the sampling, without the quantization, you don't lose any information. You, you lose the inaudible parts, but let's say we don't care about that at all. So you do not lose anything, but then the quantizing actually loses information. Um, and that you don't get back. And we'll talk next time about how to interpret that as noise, how much noise it adds. And then Huffman codes will be the next step after you quantize to save space. Okay. All right.